Okay, so I hope to, in this presentation, review the traditional Monte Carlo concepts that Jerry nicely laid up for this presentation. I'll go over something called perturbation Monte Carlo, uh, how the estimator is formed, the application of it, and then differential Monte Carlo, and how that estimator is formed. And then I'll also go over the temporal frequency domain Monte Carlo and the spatial frequency domain Monte Carlo estimators. And I'm kind of the cart before the horse kind of thing because these are actually going to be talked about in great length later in the week. Uh, but because Monte Carlo is today, I'll, I'll describe the estimators. So if you uh, have some questions about actual application of them, I think they'll be covered in the, I think temporal is on Friday, spatial is on Thursday. And then finally, I'll talk about how to set up a Monte Carlo simulation. So I wanted to review some of the traditional Monte Carlo ideas, this little road map that I take you from the RTE to a Monte Carlo estimator. I review for just a regular analog case that Jerry talked about. But the methodology is going to be similarly used in subsequent charts. So I'd like to kind of go over it here. So as Jerry described, we start with the integral differential RTE. This describes the radiance in uh, position and direction. And we use this thing called method of characteristics. Method of characteristics if you've done PDEs. Uh, but as Jerry says, it's actually a method that uh, when you reduce the RTE, uh, you, it's a method of using an integrating factor. I don't know if you guys took ODEs and there's an integrating factor you can use to solve an equation, but it's a straightforward method, and it, and it transforms the integral differential equation into an equivalent integral equation, as Jerry described. Uh, this is an equation in psi, which is the collision density. These two are related in a very easy way, uh, and I'll show you that. And then, and then once you get the integral equation formulation, components of that are going to be components of the Neumann series. The Neumann series is the solution to this. And when you get that Neumann series with the detector function f, you can produce an estimator that will provide to you the quantity that you'd like to, to estimate. So, so the roadmap is we take the integral differential, we go to the RTE through method of characteristics. Uh, we've got this Neumann series. It's composed of the elements S and K. S and K come from the integral equation. We have this detector function to evaluate a measurement I, and then a random variable is used. And it's comprised of S and K components of the R, uh, integral RTE and a detector function. Defining the elements of the photon propagation in in, in terms of S and K of the RTE ensures that the predicted measurements are going to solve the RTE, number one, and that they will be unbiased. And you'll, you'll see that as we move along. So I'm, a lot of this may be recap, but it helps for me to have it for the rest of my charts. So bear with me in the first part of this. So we start with the time-independent RTE. You've seen this before. You know the components. This is radiance. This is the phase function. Mu t is total attenuation. Mu s scattering function. Q is the source. Uh, and so one of the reasons why we transform to the integral equation to get the probability model is that we can show existence and the uniqueness of the solution. And this Neumann series, uh, it being a convergent infinite series, is a really nice aspect of creating a probability model. So like I said, we, we use the method of characteristics to transform the integral to the integral form of the RTE. You see it here. Uh, psi is the collision density, and it's related to the radiance by a factor mu t. Fancy k is an operator that acts on psi here with a function plain k here. And plain k has two components, a collision component and a transport component, kernel, I call them. And, and so the collision kernel includes the probability of scattering versus absorption. 
mu s over mu t is the probability of scattering. One minus that, which would be mu a over mu t, would be the probability of absorption. And then you have this angular phase function. So that's, that's how you change at a particular position from an incoming omega prime to an outgoing uh, omega. The first component de determines whether you keep on going or you got absorbed in an analog simulation. And the second one says, OK, if you kept on going, what angular deflection, deflection angle am I going to? And then t is this equation that you saw from Jerry. This exponential integral allows for t to vary. So you're moving from r prime to r in a certain direction omega. And this allows for varying t along that path. If, if you were in a homogeneous medium, this would just be e to the minus mu t s. And the final component of the integral equation uh, was s. In, and s is the density of first collisions. It takes the source and transports them to their first collision. So in a Monte Carlo simulation, you start with the q. You transport via S using the transport kernel that I showed on the previous chart to its first collision. Then you assess using the, the collision kernel, do I, do I scatter here or do I absorb? OK, you roll, it, you roll a random number. Oh, I scattered. What's my deflection angle? Here's my deflection angle. And then you do transport to get your next uh, interaction distance. If the, uh, at that collision, say you roll the dice again and you say, ah, oh, I, got, I got absorbed. And this is the little notation we use for a photon being absorbed. Um, I always kind of hear in my head when I see that, like the little Pac-Man sound when, when he gets killed on. So yeah, but if, he, but if you didn't, you would continue on and potentially go out a detector. So these components, S, C, and T, are elements of the random walk. We have an S that describes initiating from the source. C describes the probability of absorption versus scattering and scattering deflection angles. And T describes transport from collision to collision. So I said before, the benefit is having this this Neumann series. And the way that's written is if you rewrite the integral equation, you just collect terms, bring everything not psi onto the right-hand side. Like Jerry said, if the norm of this fancy k is less than 1, then you can expand it just like 1 over the series 1 over 1 minus x, x absolute value of x being less than 1. And you get this Neumann series here. And so it's comprised of so you're looking at you're looking at the collision density at a certain place and time, a uh, place and direction, and you're you're gathering all the photons that came from the source, that scattered directly into that uh, that location and direction, and then the ones that scattered once, and then so this is scattering once through the kernel, and then contribute. And then these are the ones that scatter twice and contribute. So if you go to infinity, you're going to get your complete solution for your collision density. And then we need a detector function, say, you, because just the solution is just the solution. We need to actually identify a detector in order to represent a measurement. And so those are represented by a weighted integral of the solution psi here in this form. And f is a known detector function. So reflectance, I think this is the detector function Jerry showed on his chart. Uh, it's comprised of a chi characteristic function. Characteristic function is pretty much just something that turns on when you satisfy a certain criteria. In this case, for reflectance, you're in some spatial uh, regime on the surface and some angular regime. If that detector had some Na, that would specify the, the delta uh, omega. That is the chi function. So basically, that just kind of turns on the fact that that photon's going to score if it satisfies 
that, those criteria for whatever detector you have defined in your problem. Now this estimator is a random variable that provides the method of tallying. And it's comprised of the elements of the RTE, this S and K, the detector function, and then it has the potential to have these weight factors in it, uh, as you saw from um, the use of discrete absorption weighting. And the probabilistic uh, representation of the measurement is the evaluation of this estimator uh, based on a measure M. And this measure is, um, is, give, is induced by the uh, probability density, the random walk process, the probability density functions are, that comprise the random walk process. And those are, components are part of S and K. So when we evaluate A, I, we are taking the expectation of this random variable with respect to the measure. We write that as an expectation with respect to this measure. And it's, it's taking the, the 1 over n times the sum of the um, Cs, where n is the number of photons launched. So let's look at uh, reflectance with the analog. Uh, we use something called the modified terminal estimator. This is a follow-on to a terminal estimator that Jerry um, designed in his seminal book on Monte Carlo. It's part of your top references there. We, the terminal estimator tallies on its terminating uh, collision. We needed to modify it slightly because we're actually, for reflectance, detecting at the surface. And a collision doesn't actually happen there. And what happens is the detector kind of intercepts the last track on its way out of the, of the uh, tissue. So we needed a new notation because we're actually tallying at something called a pseudo collision. So what would happen is at this P3, you would determine your track length, and that track length, uh, you, would, you would go until this interface, and the pseudo collision would be formed. If this was actual more tissue, you would actually figure out the residual of that track and then figure out how long it is within the optical properties up here. Um, but in this case, we actually tally at that pseudo collision. And just for notational reasons, we are using that we take the final collision this is the P sub K, in this case, 3. And the pseudo-collision notation is we superscript it with a 1. So this, this estimator uh, looks, this modified terminal estimator looks like this. Um, if you look just generally, in the red, we have the source components, and then we have the progression of the K components in the Neumann series, and then detection at the pseudo collision. But notice now I have these ratios here. And the way that I've notated it as is that the numerators are factors that come from the radiative transport equation. And the denominators are factors that actually come from the random walk process. And the reason why I mention that is that in analog, these are identical. Uh, how you roll your random walk process is identical to the way that it's described in the RTE. So all of these factors are one. And then you have your detector function, which I gave on the previous chart, which ping one if you, if you, tell, if you made it out that detector, zero if you didn't. And, and that's how you get your binomial, binomial estimate. You're just, you're just uh, ping, 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 kind of like a Geiger counter. If it makes it out, ping one if not zero. Sure. Um, so if it wasn't analog, how does the ratio change? Good question. Um, so as you saw with DAW, what happened there is that you're actually changing the denominator. Um, you're the reason why you're changing the de denominator is you're changing the, the random walk process in the fact that you're disallowing absorption. And you're allowing, and so instead, what ends up happening is these denominators are defined in such a way 
that these weight factors become that mu s over mu t. And each one of these are the mu s and or over mu t at that particular uh, p. And actually, I'm noticing now this p, this new, I didn't define what this p notation is, but this p, p i is just a position, bold r, and r i and omega i direction. Uh, we just simplify it to shorten up notation here. But so yeah, this, these, um, these would come from disallowing absorption. These would come from the regular RTN ends up having uh, a factor of mu s over mu t evaluated at that location. And that if it was heterogeneous, if it was homogeneous, it would just be mu s of the tissue over mu t to the power k k being the number of collisions. See, it just, it just de-weights at each collision. So whatever this last weight was at the final collision before exit, that's, that's the DAW weight. OK. So I'm moving on to a new topic, kind of uh, in case there are any questions on what I've described so far. I'll continue on. You can pull me back to that if you have questions. So I'll go into something called perturbation Monte Carlo. Perturbation Monte Carlo is a method to determine, say you have a measurement or a prediction of a measurement that was produced by a Monte Carlo simulation. PMC is a way to produce the change to that measurement given changes to optical properties. So. So we're looking to see how can we evaluate or estimate this new reflectance in this particular case. This works for any kind of measurement. That's what's shown here. And, and, and it's equal to whatever uh, it was, say, for healthy tissue, plus what the change would be due to some, say, change to optical properties. And I, I, I notate them very generally here. They can be. Um, a lot of different things. So uh, this alpha is a vector of optical properties. And in this region here, we have some change to them. One way you could solve this problem is you could just run another simulation. You could say, OK, well, we have this tumorous region. We have a heterogeneous system defined here. The optical properties in here are, are alpha hat. The optical properties in here are alpha. And then you could just run a heterogeneous Monte Carlo simulation. But if you were looking to estimate this change delta i for a variety of different alpha hats, then this could be computationally costly, because you're running a simulation for every single value you're, you have of, of interest. So PMC allows you to evaluate the background problem and any number of these i hats for any changes to alpha hat, given a single set of random walks. So this is what you do. You create a, a database. Um, you, you first, and, and you can, um, you set up the problem of the baseline, uh, and, and you create a database. So I'm showing a homogeneous system here. It could be heterogeneous as well, just for simplicity, it's homogeneous. And you, you, know, but you know that there's an area here of which you, you're going to want to know if there's changes to the optical properties there, what are the changes to my reflectance? So you run a simulation, and you store pertinent information about the photon biographies into this database. And from this database, you can, you can make uh, some baseline measurement prediction. Uh, could be any, it could be reflectance versus rho, time, spatial frequency, temporal frequency, fluence, or radiance. I just happened to show reflectance here. Hannah. So do you do that for each individual photon biography? You do. So that's a lot of memory you have to worry about, and you have to choose your parameters carefully? Or? Well, the pertinent information is smaller than you might think. So I'll show you on the next chart. Uh, well, maybe not this chart, but the next one after that. OK, so, <laughs> so then you post-process uh, the database for the perturbed problem. 
So um, now you have this system, you have this region, you have your perturbed optical properties, and the way that you, you form how you, you estimate the perturbed reflectance correctly is through application of something called a radon nicotine derivative. The perturbed estimator is the background estimator uh, hit with this weight. And this weight is d mu hat d mu. It's it, where mu hat is the perturbed measure. It's the PDFs that gave rise to, to that measure. And then in the denominator is the baseline. So you can see here that perturbed reflectance is the expectation of a perturbed estimator. But instead, what we do is we take the background, we hit it with a certain weight, and evaluate it with the background measure, the background set of random walks. You can see that if you kind of cancel these two, then you would be evaluating the estimator with the perturbed random walk system. That would be like if you ran an independent system where you took track of, oh, OK, I entered this, now my optical properties changed and all that. But instead, we use the random walks of the baseline and then apply this weight. So in the case of DAW, for instance, we have the uh, detected photon weight of the baseline problem. Let's assume it's homogeneous. There's only one mu s in the whole tissue. And so your weight is this A factor, which accounts for specular reflection. And then mu s over mu t to the power k, k being the number of collisions prior to detection. So the pertinent information that you need to store are the, the number of collisions that occur in this perturbed region and the total path length. And the reason why that is is that if you look at the DAW detected photon weight, so you have your baseline, you have your specular baseline. Here is your C correction. Okay, so if you look, remember C is the probability of scattering. So this is the probability of scattering in the perturbed problem over probability of scattering in the baseline problem to the power k, j, j being the number of collisions that occurred in the perturbed region. And then this weight factor accounts for the change in the t. So you can see here that this numerator is mu t e to the minus mu t and little s for each little track. But then if you sum them over all the tracks in here, it's the total track length in that perturbed region. And this accounts for the number of collisions. So this is the radon nicotine derivative uh, being applied to the background estimator to give us a perturbed estimator. So what I've shown here is a plot of the resulting, um, this I think is, uh, 100,000 photons. The red is the baseline. I changed absorption by a factor of a half in the solid blue. And then I multiplied by a factor of two in the line right here. And you can see that these, you can see kind of the ripples. They're very, so one of the benefits about PMC is that the results are correlated. And that correlation is key because it's capturing the actual difference due to the change in optical properties rather than any statistical error that would have been produced if you ran an independent random walk th set of random walks through the perturbed system. So, so you get that benefit that the results are correlated. And, um, and then another benefit is that you can produce these, so you have this database, you can just go, okay, photon one. How many collisions? What's your path length? Boom, here's your estimator. So it took me 4.8 minutes. I was actually running, that sounds like really long to run 100 million photons. I mean, 100,000 photons, but I was using MATLAB interop. So it took me that, it took me this many minutes to run this many photons, but to pro post process this many photons, it took me 0.7 seconds. So it's, it's, uh, it's real fast. And, and the nice thing means, it, so, Correlation, it's fast. It means that now Monte Carlo could be used in an inverse solution. 
So, um, because Monte Carlo in the past has been kind of forbidden because it, at each iteration that you try to find your, your inverse solution, you don't want to run another simulation. And then an extension of perturbation Monte Carlo is differential Monte Carlo, where you can find the derivatives of this reflectance with respect to any of the parameters. This gives you sensitivity coefficients. You can see how, how sensitive your measurement is to different changes in your optical properties. It tells you a lot about how, how your ability to be able to identify any changes there. Um, and that would allow you to fit tissue changes to measurements, uh, identifying any change, uh, delta A's. Uh, and then having this, this gradient information allows you to use a lot more robust inverse solutions, optimization methods, which I'll get into more uh, on Thursday. Uh, and I'll actually get more details about use of PMC and DMC in an inverse. This is more just to show the method. And then we can show that the derivative of the estimator is an estimate of the derivative. And that has been shown. So, so these, are, these derivatives are also unbiased and provide um, unbiased estimates of the derivative of your measurement with respect to any uh, optical property change. So some of the details. Just taking the derivative, I'm just trying to show that it's a straightforward thing. So you have your, your regular estimator here. You want to take the derivative with respect to a change in mu A or mu S. You just expand these hats, and you just take a straightforward derivative. It's a lot of kind of calculation and bookkeeping while you're, when you write your code, but that's all it is. It's not, it's not, uh, not difficult. So this shows a plot of the baseline with the same set of uh, random walks that were st stored in that database of the derivative um, and then mu a divided by a half and then mu a times 2 up here. And again, you can kind of see these, these uh, correlations. And I was staring at this the other when I made it because I go, this looks kind of non-intuitive because you would think that when I first stared at this, I thought, well, it looks like the derivative is the greatest. This is on a regular scale, not log. The, the magnitude is the greatest closest to the source. And I don't know if we still have these labs, but w one way to kind of, and, and, it, and intuitively I thought the, the uh, information about um, UA might be farther out in row. And I think plotting this divided by the reflectance might give you a better idea about that. So in case you were wondering, hey, kind of scratching your head like I did. Anyways, uh, this is all I'm going to cover for PMC and DMC today. I'll give more when we actually talk about inverse problems on Thursday. So I'm going to change gears a little bit and move to spatial frequency Monte Carlo estimation. And um, yeah, so I have a little <laughs> cartoon here. You'll see, you'll see uh, a lot better uh, descriptions of these when you, it's covered on Thursday. But basically, you're giving a uh, spatially modulated source, illuminating the tissue with spatially modulated source. And often, they just uh, they're sinusoidals along the x-axis. You can, the formulation is general enough that you could have for sinusoidal s along the x and y-axis, but for s just right now, we'll just assume that they're x-sinusoidals. And, and this is uh, illuminated onto the tissue, and then uh, this is my little depiction of a camera, and then the reflected light is, is uh, measured, and you're, we're interested in the phase delay and the change in amplitude, that signal. And that captures, that change, those changes captures uh, information about the tissue subsurface characteristics. So the way that we get to the estimator from the, the 
RTE is that we Fourier transform the RTE along transverse directions and you get a spatial frequency integral differential equation here describing the radiance. Then we transform this with the method of characteristics like we've done before, get a collision density, and then from that we can get our estimator. So I kind of put a dashed line around this segment of the process because that's, that's the same as doing it in, in the regular uh, transformations. I just wanted, the process is the same, the details are different. So here we start with the time independent RTE. We do the 2D Fourier transform over the transverse dimensions and you end up with an equation that looks like here. Notice that two things, there's a dependence on Z here. This is an omega Z only here, derivative with respect to Z only here, instead of a, a omega vector a dot grad. So um, the dependence on Z here and here. And then also notice that we've got this new term in red here. And this is all, this formulation is all due to Adam Gardner in his optics letters. So we, again, use the method of characteristics. We find a different integrating fa factor. And we end up getting an integral RTE that looks like this. But now the components are shown here, where, where you see not only there's a change with Z, dependence on Z here, but you also have this red factor in, in K and S. So when we substitute things into the estimator for the modified terminal estimator, the components that I showed on the previous chart are, are the S and K from the RTE. But we run the random walk process, as you, as you can see, those, those have funny factors in them, but we run the pro random walk process based on, based on um, the regular RTE measure. So we're still transporting, colliding, doing that same process. And what ends up happening is that these, these factors now um, accumulate a weight factor at each collision. And each collision you get that, this weight factor of e to the minus 2 pi spatial frequency um, and the difference in the x components of the two collision endpoints. And then we have to account for that last little partial track to the pseudo collision as it exits the, the tissue. And if you work this all out, it ends up being that all you're interested in, these all kind of cancel because there's a minus, and you get this ending estimator that is just minus 2 pi i spatial frequency and the difference between where you injected that photon and where it came out in x, along the x-axis. So if it was initiated at 0, 0, 0, then the final tally is just the exiting x component uh, of the position that it exited and this exponential here. Any questions about that? Okay. Um. I'm a tiny bit confused about the tally because that's a complex number. So it looks like a four days series to me as well. So when we were talking about the binary tally before, it was basically number of photons that come out. Right. What are we counting here? Okay. So here, so what's happening is when when that photon was just one, you just counted one. We were using analog, and all these weights were one. So this detector function was just a chi function, bing, one, 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 one. Now these uh, ratios are actually um, creating a weight factor. Um, these weight factors, each one of these, comes from the fact that the kernel that came from the RTE of this Fourier, so, so, so now see this kernel has this this extra factor in it. And so when 
you evaluate this estimator, you're going to accumulate at each collision a weight factor. And that, that's, that exponential is being accumulated here. So this weight, this, this is what you would tally. Whatever, and it's, it is a complex weight. It is, and, it's ba and, and you know, for whatever spatial frequency, what's nice is that for all the different spatial frequencies that you're interested in, you, you tally them all at once with this, and then, you, and then you move on to the next photon, let's tally them, and the, for each spatial frequency, you just, bit, you just make sure you're, you're adding to the right spatial frequency, and then you sum them up and you divide by n the number launched. Okay. Okay. So what do the real and imaginary components there actually denote in that tally? Well, they're the complex weights that the photons tallying from that uh, will get. So you could separate them and, and, and tally them in their real and imaginary, get a mean for that, and estimate the phase and amplitude. I see. Yeah. Of, but, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, of, of uh, what the detected signal is. But the amplitude for that, uh, what you've given, is always going to be one, right? You have uh, e to i times a real number. Uh, for, for yeah, this is real, itself. fx and here, right? Yeah, uh -huh. so, so you know, e to the i anything is, uh, has, has a, a modulus a, of a one. A modulus of one. So I, I guess I'm just confused over, over or like where we're we getting like the tally of the number of photons in the phase. Is it just from the individual components, or is it from the amplitude of the signal? No. Okay. Have? So okay. So good question. Okay. So what we're telling is actually the real and imaginary. Okay. So it's not. We're not telling the amplitude. So so when we tally this, we have a real component of this, the cosine portion, and we tally that to the real portion and then and then that's averaged and then the the um, the sign component the complex component imaginary component is tallied and then those are deter used to determine the amplitude and phase so that doesn't necessarily Compare the previous method, the spatial frequency domain method, actually the detector and source is just you know, not directly contact the specimen. True. But is there any I mean, effect, effect because of the, between this, just between the, the specimen and the source and detector, there's the error. Just the error? Yeah. Just error. Is, is there any effect? Is, no. is there a... We, we can just ignore the error effect? Yeah, well, uh... Uh, the, in air, photons travel in straight lines, I mean, given it's not a cloudy day or foggy day or something, but you know, you just straight, you just, uh, so if you have a, a source that's above the tissue, it's just a straight line propagation from whatever direction it's, it's oriented to in that, and then it hits the, the tissue and then gets propagated in. Yeah. to change the light. Yeah, it doesn't scatter or uh, absorb. Yeah. I think there was a question up here. Um, so the Z here, that's the random number estimator, right? C, yeah, C, this one. Yeah, yeah. so Greek my C. question is, for the SFD domain, uh -huh. um, the source and detector remains all the same compared to the spatially result method, the only thing changes is embedded into the random number estimator. Is that true? Well, no, it's a different, uh, so um, in, in the spatially resolved, you have like a fiber source and then detectors on, on top of the tissue. This is a wide field source that's actually illuminating the entire surface of the tissue. I probably ha should have a, oh. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the source, how do you model the source oh. of the Monte Carlo? Oh, 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 good question. Good question. I see what you're I saying. I the detector, but because I went over the code and there seemed to be no difference in the source and detector yeah. when it comes to SFD domain or uh, time frequency domain. Okay. So how you take care good of that? Good question. Um, so as, I don't know if you remembered, but on, on um, Monday, Vasan was 
describing how one of the benefits about spatial frequency is that it's kind of a relative change. So, so what we do, you're, you're, all you're interested in is the distance along the x-axis from where you injected, the, where the source injected the photon. So the way we actually run it is that we just have a point source at 0, 0, 0, and then we run the photons, and we capture everything that comes out the top. And wherever it came out, you determine the distance along the x-axis, and then you add that tally with that particular spatial frequency to, to, to your, your so, estimation. Which means source and detector remains the similar um, as in the spatially resolved method. Well, no, because the spatially resolved, well, it depends. If you had detectors on the whole surface of the spatially resolved, yes, I guess it would. Yeah. And I guess from now that you have the complex weight, so how do you get the um, reflectance from here? I guess there is a shortcut method. Would you go over that? Well, this is, this is actually the shortcut method for spatial frequency. There's a, the term shortcut method that Testorf used for um, the temporal frequency, which I'll show next. But you would you would um, you would determine like your real and imaginary components of this weight, and then get estimations, averages of those, and then get your amplitude and phase from those. And that would show you, in my little cartoon, that would show you what, uh, what your difference was in the reflectance, given a sp specific spatial frequency. Is that, did I answer? I think the essence of the shortcut method is that you actually perform the simulation in the transform domain. You don't perform it in the native space. Uh, the way you have to do that, then, is to carry complex weights. Um, and there's nothing wrong with complex weights. Uh, as Carol suggested, if you separate into real and imaginary parts, you have real numbers that represent phase changes in the waves in the, and give you the information that you're looking for. But the shortcut method is essentially that. Uh, and in the time domain, it also has to do with the accuracy of doing that versus doing uh, simulating in the native space and then transforming. It has to do with the error analysis of it. Sure. Sure, that was, that was a good segue into my next chart, which is the temporal frequency reflectance. And here you have an a amplitude modulated wave uh, with time being injected into the tissue. And then you measure at a detector the change to the amplitude and then change to the phase with respect to time. And this gives you information about the tissue characteristics. So again, we form this roadmap where we take the time-dependent integral differential equation. We Fourier transform that to a, a, a radiance as a function of omega. And then we do the transformation with the characteristics, method of characteristics to the collision density. And then we get our estimator here. So similar roadmap. Again, this methodology is the same as I've been describing. So here we have the time-dependent RTE. If you take the temporal Fourier transform of the RTE, you get something that looks like this. And note that it looks a lot like the original. The only difference here is this extra factor. And here is the Fourier transform here. So we use that same method of characteristics. We now get a collision density equation here. Here are the k and s of this integral equation. Note that this k, so you know we have the the this portion of it is is the transport, the t part of the t kernel. But we're now we've got this extra factor here. And then we have the collision part here. 
and S here, we have this T, we have Q and we're transporting it, but we have this extra factor here. So again, we use the modified terminal estimator. If you'll, you'll have those weights due to the fact that you're, you're running the, the measure, the denominators are going to have the C and T of the original RTE. And, and these <coughs> exponents now have a form that look like this. And this distance over velocity gets changed to a time here. So yeah, each one of these are the little path lengths of each track and then they sum up. And this total time, this total time, this is the time to that pseudo collision of exit. And that time is determined by your path length. So we take the path length of the photon and we divide it by the speed of light in the tissue, and that gives us our time. Question. Sure. So you, you said something about a pseudo collision on exit. That just means what we're looking at is the pattern of structured light that arrives back at the surface. Well, no, the, that, that pseudo, the reason why I mentioned the pseudo collision is that that, that little portion of a path between the last collision and you exit the detector is important to getting the total path length or, or time from source to detector. But yeah, so what we're measuring at that particular, and in this case, there's usually a source detector separation. So you're injecting the uh, temporal frequency here and then you're measuring uh, what at a particular distance. So, 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 I should get better markers. Are these that you can erase though? Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, maybe, maybe kind of how you might look at it is that, you know, you're putting in, you're mo putting in this being time, this is your source, and, and then you're coming out here at a certain detector and you're, you're measuring kind of how that changed with respect to the phase change and the amplitude. The question was oh. about the pseudo-collision. What is the pseudo-collision? Oh, okay. Yeah. Is that what your question Yeah, that's, that's part of my question. Okay. Let me, let me, um, it, just if, if I may, so we're, we're, we're talking about, um, we're, we're basically talking about ballistic photons here. We're talking about radio transport, not electromagnetic waves. Even though we're talking about a phase and an amplitude, the phase and the amplitude refer to structured illumination. Yes. Whether it's in space or in time or both. Yes. And how that gets modified by the tissue and projected back on, let's call it a projection screen at the tissue air interface. Correct. Am I on the right page? You here? are. Okay. And then, and the last part of my question is that what you called a, a pseudo collision to sum up that last little bit after the last real collision? Yes. Yeah. So, so, you know, we, we go from here, we come in, and typically when you, when you sample that distance PDF, it actually, it actually takes you to a position, you know, it, it's a certain length, and it actually takes you beyond the tissue, but the tally is actually happening right here. And so that's why we put a little pseudo collision right there, because we actually want to capture not this distance, or time. We don't want to capture this time. We want to capture the time as it exits. And, and back in the spatial frequency domain, you also need to know not only you, you need to know not only the location, but you need to know direction. Correct. Well, the you direction need direction that emerges from the surface. Yeah, you do. You do um, definitely. If you have an NA uh, in your detector, I'm thinking of practical yeah. uh, practical measurement in the laboratory. You do. How do I collect this with a camera and see? the difference between what goes in and what comes out and assess from that something useful down inside the tissue. So then I need to know the direction that comes out. True. 
You do. And that, and that comes out in, in all this math? Yeah, well, that comes out in the detector. That detector function, remember I had a, a chi, a, a characteristic function that turns on if you're in the angular domain mm -hmm. uh, and the spatial domain. And so that angular domain would pick out, say you had a camera with a particular NA that was only capturing photons that were coming out at a certain angle, then that detector function would turn on the ones that came out. Uh, ah, it would only see the ones that came out within the, within the collection code. Yes. I'm with, I'm with you now. Thank okay. you. Cool. Cool. Oh. Okay. It's a very small comment, but just add that you, you can model your source also with a, a range of numerical apertures so that you have to mimic the actual source of, of angles approaching approaching the surface as well. And we do that all the time. OK, so I'm going to do a complete shift now and describe how our software is, uh, the Monte Carlo software is kind of organized. Um, so we have, and you'll hear more about the details, but I kind of wanted to describe the Monte Carlo. We have this virtual tissue simulator library. And within it, we have conventional Monte Carlo code. I call it conventional Monte Carlo. It's all the codes that I've described today. And that set of code is utilized by three different interfaces. We have a Monte Carlo command line, this has the fullest capabilities. You run it from a command line. It has um, source, tissue, detector, PMC, DMC. It's all in there. Uh, we also have a MATLAB interop. It, it's a nice little front end. If you're familiar with MATLAB and you want to use your code, it's, it's a fast way of getting up and rolling. And it has fewer um, capabilities than the full command line. But there's, I think there's a fair amount there that can satisfy most of the situations that you're looking for. And then we have a panel on the GUI that allows you to run Monte Carlo simulations. And this has the fewest capabilities. But this is meant for somebody who wants to, maybe a novice who wants to run a simulation and kind of get some quick and dirty results. Um, and you'll get experience with all of these in the labs this afternoon. So we have a, a CodePlex site that houses all of our software. And if you go to our website that comes up on the browsers, on the computers in the lab, go to Developers, and then cl click to go to the CodePlex, and then Download, you could get those three, Monte Carlo Command Lab, MATLAB Interop, uh, and the GUI. And then included in the download, and this is for the Monte Carlo Command Line, I'm going to describe that because it has the most capabilities. There's example in files. I think there's about 10 or 12 example in files of different, uh, you know, commonly asked for uh, systems. In this case, it's just a, it's just a one layer homogeneous tissue with all the detectors uh, defined in it. And, uh, and then we have documentation of, of how to set up these in files and run them So just to give you an idea of what the in file looks like, I just just took a screenshot of it and then an annotated it with red here of what, what uh, the different components are. So in the header part, we, you list where you want to put your output. This is just a folder name. How many photons you want to run. Uh, we have the ability to seed the random number generator. This allows you to do reproducible simulation. This helps a lot in debugging. You uh, sometimes want to run, something goes wrong, and you want to see that exact simulation again. And that's why we allow this option. If you turn it to minus 1, it'll do a totally random seed. Each time you run it, it's going to have another uh, set of random walks that get generated. Our random number generator type is a Mersenne twister. This is one of the best ones out there right now. It's uh, designed by a guy named Matsumoto. Uh, and it has an incredibly long period. Um, and so we don't actually have any options on that. It's, it's the random number generator. Here you can specify your absorption weighting type. And this file had discrete in it, but you could set this to analog 
or continuous to run any of the uh, methods that uh, Jerry described uh, this morning. And then the phase function, we have a Henry Greenstein here. Uh, we also have bidirectional. We use bidirectional a lot because the bidirectional uh, RTE has an analytic solution. So a lot of times when we're debugging things, we, we set up a bidirectional system and, and run a Monte Carlo system, uh, simulation, see if it agrees with the analytic solution. This is a place that you could put the databases if you wanted to post-process for PMC. I also want to say that you could just generate databases and run, you don't have to do PMC, you can just run a whole bunch of photons and then just post-process them. Say you want to look at reflectance, but you don't know what source detector separations that you're interested in, you know, just keep on reading that database and generate my reflectance with different uh, parameters. And then we keep some statistics like how many photons are out the top, the bottom killed, and how, uh, whether you want to turn on Russian roulette, this specifies the threshold, if it's greater than zero, and like Jerry said, if the photon weight goes below that threshold, then with a certain probability, you kill it, and with a certain probability, you keep it alive, but you boost the weight in a fair game so that uh, it's an unbiased operation. And then this simulation index is just an index of when you're running. We have the capability in the software to run in parallel. So if you're running the Monte Carlo, uh, it will know that you're on a parallel system and run them on the separate processors. We also have this ability to do a sweep input where you could say, I have this system. I have these optical properties of the tissue. It's a homogeneous tissue even if it wasn't homogeneous, but for say it's homogeneous, you could say, run it for mu A of the tissue equal this starting value in this ending value with this increment, and mu S the same way. So um, uh, David Kucha, who is the um, software architect, um, came up with this ability because he wanted to generate a whole suite of uh, reflectance estimates for a grid of of optical properties, so allowed him to do it in one command. And uh, let's see, and that information is all on our documentation on how you would do that, how the the syntax of how you would do that on the command line. When the weight below the threshold, uh, what is the reason that don't kill directly and use Russian roulette? Say that so again. When the weight of the photon below the threshold. Yeah. What is the reason that don't kill directly and use Russian roulette? Well, so what is the reason why you don't kill it? Yeah. So so you have to make the gain so Russian roulette the idea is to Russian roulette is to kind of kill off photons that run too long. But in order to do that, to make it a fair game and make sure that you're just not killing them, like if you were just to say kill them when they got below a certain weight, then then your results would be biased. Your reflectance results would be biased. So what this allows you to do is if the weight goes below, you kill it with a certain probability, but with a with a complementary uh, probability, you let it stay alive but boost the weight. So it's a, it makes the ability to kill photons be fair. So just another way of saying the same thing is that uh, from an engineering point of view or a physics point of view, you have to conserve energy, right? So if you're killing all these photons, you're not allowing the energy to be fairly deposited in the tissue. So what you can do is you could say, OK, if I drop below a certain weight, say 90% of the time, I'm just going to kill it. But 10% of the time, I'm going to take that weight and multiply it by 10 and let it propagate further. And so on a conservation of energy level, you've conserved energy. And in mathematics, you say you get an unbiased result because you're not biasing kind of the energy dynamics. Does that help? Yeah. Thanks, Vasa. Somehow my, oh, here, there we go. Uh, so this is an example of a source. I picked the simplest one. This is a directional point. Uh, you specify the position on the surface and then the direction and direction, you know, uh, direction cosines here. We have 
uh, positive Z is into the tissue. And we have a multitude, Jonica made a multitude of sources of any kind that you could physically, in most optics situations, we have surface illuminating sources, we have internal surface sources, internal volume sources, uh, any spatial and uh, angular specification that you might be interested in. And there's actually a, uh, a PDF on this on this uh, website that describes all the different sources. And this initial tissue region index specifies whether you actually want to start the photon uh, in the air or starting in the tissue. Do you want it to go through the actual um, check of if it gets spe specularly reflected or, or Fresnel and Snells, or do you just want to launch inside? Do we have the mic up? Thanks, Frank. Thanks. Now that you just m mentioned that, I didn't, I haven't seen yet anywhere when we're making our decisions on what the photon does, any type of boundary conditions. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. That's good. So, yeah, we 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 didn't cover that, but yeah, as the photon. So, so usually we've got air up here, and then, you know, we've got tissue. And so as the photon comes in here, and there's a, a, you know, there's a certain critical angle, if it's outside that critical angle, it's just going to bounce. But if it's inside that critical angle, then we actually determine in a probabilistic way whether, uh, whether it goes out or comes back in. And, and if it goes out, then it goes through Snell's. So yeah, these boundary conditions are handled. That's the way our code is working. There's actually other ways to do it in Monte Carlo where you actually split the photon uh, at this point and you put half this way and half of that went out. Uh, there's a lot of bookkeeping. Are you shaking your head? Yeah, it wouldn't be half. It's based on the Fresnel flight. Oh, yeah, no, no, yeah. yeah. I mean, half in a portion, meaning not exactly half. Yeah, a portion of it. A portion would come in and a portion would go out based on the Fresnel. Yes, yeah, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Not 0.5. Just, you know, this is just, you know, show the source type. Yeah. But I just wondering then if the special domain or the frequent time frequency domain actually we, time domain maybe we using the pulse source and the frequency domain maybe we use a modulated source, right? Then in that case, is there any factor to control that kind of source type? Yeah. Like so if we want the pulse source, then but just in the, the code show me that any just you know factor to. No. Change the source code something. Like that. Be because the in the spatial domain, see if I'm answering this, uh, answering your question. But in the spatial and temporal frequency domain, the um, the the source is actually a point source directly in, and you're you're going to to measure the change to that via the path length or the distance that it emerges in spatial frequency domain. So um, there's no. Uh, you know, we're, we're solving this in the Fourier domain. Um, so, I mean, you, you could, if you wanted to, you could illuminate, like in spatial frequency, you could illuminate the surface with a sinusoidal pattern and measure everything coming out as an alternate. But uh, this shortcut cut method actually provides, uh, I think, a, a, you know, an, an unbiased and, and good way to, to produce that result. Equivalent result. So I think your your underlying question is: Do you model continuous sources differently than pulsed sources? Oh. I think the answer is no. I mean, essentially, as Carol said, um, when the photon exits, if you tally the path length, then you know the time. If you're not interested in a time resolve simulation, you just tally everything regardless of the path length, and you've gotten your steady state result. 
So, um, so there's no need specifically to model time varying sources differently from continuous sources. It's just that you've got to make sure that in the Monte Carlo simulation, you tally the path length upon exit and then convert that to your time to put it in a different time bin. But if you're not interested, then you just put every photon out and put it in the same bin. Is that in, in a sense, you could you could do this in a in an impulse response sort of way, right? Where you just you you ping the material with a delta function of in time of photons, and then look at the temporal spread, which 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 actually comes from a path length spread. Yes. And yes. then from that, you could backtrack and you could build up any arbitrary temporal modulation to figure out what it what it meant. But in a sense, you don't need to do that. Yeah. Because you've got the ten, you've got you've got the impulse response. And and there's there's problems with that. Okay. I think. So, so if you're, that's true. Um, but I think the value of the shortcut method that the shortcut methods that Carol introduced is that if you say take the time domain case and you get your temporal spread, then if you want to get the temporal frequency domain result, you would have to do a Fourier transform on that result. And that has inaccuracies associated with the binning, the binning or the, 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 the temporal sectioning of that interval. And when you use the shortcut method, you avoid all of those inaccuracies. There's no aliasing, there's no sampling degradation in your Fourier transform because you're tallying at exactly the proper time at which the, every single photon, on a photon by photon basis, you're you're finding out what is the the time of emission of that photon, and you're hitting it exactly with the modulation frequency that you're interested in. Rather than at some point you'll be binning, you know, if you're looking at a at a at an impulse response, and then there's inaccuracies due to that binning. Okay. Yeah. Stepping a bit outside my own comfort zone here, but just for the sake of discussion, I was speaking with a researcher who was also a physiotherapist a while back, and they develop, um, it's almost like a wrap with a bunch of near-infrared LEDs for tissue healing. And he claims that in his field, they have results that indicate that pulsing them does increase penetration depth. They're, they're, di or they're not considered with the imaging side of things, they're considered with how far can it penetrate into the tissue for the healing. Um, I haven't seen that, uh, I haven't come across that, that literature from within the field, but that was uh, a point that he did bring up. So perhaps there is some sort of fundamental temporal property to what's happening. Again, that, that's outside of my area of expertise. So. Pulsing at what frequency? It's a good question. I, I can get in, in touch with him if, if we want to follow up on a conversation with him. I think it's quite fast. Actually, for, for you, Robert, um, when you say how deeply they penetrate, are you talking about how deeply the healing goes or how deeply the IR light actually penetrates? Uh, the light for the healing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're healing through the use of the photons, right. I guess, and, and to excite the tissue of someone. Right. So oh, yeah. I was just wondering. It, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was wondering, it, you know, is it possible that um, maybe the pulsing is helping out the healing on a, on a more superficial layer that's, you know, things are doing better and then that's starting to go deeper. Like, yeah. I, I guess I'm just playing devil's advocate. Yeah, no, that very well could be. Again, I'm no expert. Right. But, uh, yeah. So here's our tissue definition, and I gave an example on which there's air, tissue, and air below. This is what we call a multi-layer tissue. You could have multiple layers of tissue in between. And so you give ranges in Z. I wanted to, I made these little squiggly lines, meaning that it's infinite in that extent. So in X and Y, uh, it's infinite. All you're specifying here is the start and stop with respect to a Z and um, and defining the optical properties within which each of those layers, if you choose layers. We also have ability to do an ellipsoid or sphere. I've also used that ellipsoid in a really long way to uh, imitate a vessel. Um, and we also have a voxel that was requested because people were making uh, phantoms with a, 
with an inclusion that had a, a rectangular shape to it. So those are, like, this is an open source um, uh, code, and so, uh, you know, a lot of times we have requests or people who want certain things for their particular um, research, and ideally it'd be great if they contributed, but if they can't because they're not a coder, then, then we try to, to uh, you know, help them out as we, as we can. And then just to give you an idea, so for spatial frequency, we, this is the detector definition. You, you specify a start and a stop and a count. In this particular case, you're getting spatial frequency at, the, at these values. Um, and, and this is a teletype. You can name it different things. Say you can have as many of these spatial R of FX in the file as you want. You can put in and, and just name them appropriately because they're going to be uh, output to that name. And so you want to keep them distinct in your output folder. This uh, tally second moment is set to true if you want to calculate your errors. That's where the variance is coming in. And this is a bunch of information that's just uh, descriptive of the, of the detector and actually doesn't need to be changed. And just to be complete, I show an R of omega here too. And one thing I want to note is that there's a difference between a bin and a particular, so like in spatial frequency, you want the tally at a specific spatial frequency. Omega 2, you want it at a specific spatial frequency. But when you're tallying out a, a source detector separation, you actually have to spell out bins where the photon, because a photon won't come out one single point, to spell out, in this case, row bins, which are concentric rings uh, in a homogeneous or layered system. And so um, there's a little slight difference between telling a bin versus at a particular omega or spatial frequency. So, uh, you know, you run it, you bring it up a command line, uh, you can download the MCCL from CodePlex and then typing MC in file equal in file whatever name. This also works on Linux and OS X. Um, and then you can plot the results using MATLAB with this script and you'll get experience with, with that in the labs this afternoon. And just kind of to recount the units that we use in the software. And then just my last chart has to do with scaled uh, Monte Carlo. The, I wanted to emphasize that we have something in the forward and inverse panels called scaled Monte Carlo. But it's a slightly, it's a different beast than the conventional. That's why I wanted to make this little Venn diagram because it's, it's independent. Uh, the way it gets generated is independent of the way the conventional Monte Carlo rolls. So what happens here in this, the, the uh, basic is actually due to a method by Keenly and Patterson. The results of, for reflectance versus row and time for a single Monte Carlo simulation for certain reference optical properties is saved and rescaled very quickly uh, to provide results for different MUA and MUS primes. So they have a little algorithm that allows you to take these results and figure out if the op mu a is different from this or mu s prime, how to, to present a reflected uh, reflectance. Um, so it's a, it's a scaling, but it's not the scaling like in PMC. It's not on a photon by photon basis. It's just taking the results. And then uh, Michele Martinelli came to work with us uh, here at BLI and extended this basic algorithm and added in adaptive binning. They figured out to make some of the bins at the distal, distal bins and the long time bins larger so the variance is a little more evenly distributed. And they also applied non-uniform rational B splines uh, to, pr to pr present a smoother uh, reflectance approximation. And uh, that's identified. So in these forward and inverse panels, there'll be a pull down. And at the bottom, you'll see something like scaled Monte Carlo basic, scaled Monte Carlo NURBS. That's, that's uh, what's happening in, when you select those. And um, 
you know, uh, despite the fact that they don't provide estimates on a photon by photon basis, uh, they provide uh, decent approximations for homogeneous tissue. And you'll get, you'll see that when uh, you run some labs later this week. So I hope that I gave you an idea of how the PMC and DMC estimators are derived and why they're unbiased and their advantages. Um, you know, uh, how you would uh, derive the estimator for the spatial and temporal frequency domain Monte Carlo. And then just an introduction on how to run a Monte Carlo simulation with the command line and uh, how to plot the results. So thank you. It seems like uh, your uh, simulator is homegrown. Uh, yes. Here, it seems. Um, yeah. Is there is 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 that like the best out there? Is there is there commercial uh, simulators? Oh yeah, there's there well, there's a lot of commercial other? simulators out there uh, that do um, transport Monte Carlo ray tracing, as they call it. Um, and yeah, it's and they have biological applications. Um, it's funny though, um, Jerry and I, uh, I don't, we, we happened to, to meet with one of them, uh, I, I won't say their name, but you know, we started meeting one of the engineers and it turns out there, we found some details about their simulation that wasn't um, so unbiased and um, it may be that their results for the type of, um, you know, system that they're looking at is, is good enough. And so, um, so yeah, we, we, uh, there are those alternatives out there. Um, I don't know uh, if I'd vouch for a lot of them. I'd have to see the actual underlying software to feel, for me, comfortable using them. But um, yeah, we designed this because, um, you know, there's so many people who go to Monte Carlo when they get more complex tissue definitions or they get with outside the realm of standard diffusion. Um, they need some things that can handle complex geometries or when the optical properties aren't comparable, mu A and scattering aren't comparable, or the, you're not really close to the source if you're doing really uh, detection close to the source, then standard diffusion uh, approximations cannot, cannot run so or will not be valid. So um, uh, one of the reasons why we were motivated to, to create our own software. Maybe Jerry has something to add about that. Yeah, I'd just like to add that um, in the light transport community, there are people who are creating Monte Carlo simulations for movies, for film, for video games. Uh, they're, they're not necessarily what we call transport rigorous. And they don't need to be for their application, they say, because they're only interested in the speed of execution and the appearance on the screen. So it's appearance modeling, different set of criteria. Of course, we wouldn't want to use that as gold standard in biomedicine. So that's why we expend a lot of energy trying to show that the, the work we do is, is you know, meets the standards we want. Um, but they're doing some awfully clever things. So if you want to look at some of the nicest work on simulation, go to that community. Their annual meeting, SIGGRAPH, is huge and the people who present there are very talented, very impressive results. So I thought I'd give my two cents as well. So uh, apart from the community uh, looking at visualization and graphics, there, there are several other groups in biophotonics that Chin -chin. have open source efforts uh, Chin Chin Zhang, I think mm -hmm. is his name. He's at uh, Northeastern University now. He has an open source software effort that looks really at, um, that allows you to do fully voxelized 
uh, models of biological tissue and very complicated geometries. Um, and, and I think on the whole that code is very good, but there are also perhaps um, choices that might be made differently and how they deal with interfaces between voxels and things like that. Um, the workhorse in the field was, uh, is a code that was developed by Steve Schatz and Li Han Wang called MCML, and that's, that's out there, and a lot of people have, have used that as a workhorse. I think there's also a group, I can't remember if it's Wake Forest or in Virginia Tech, I think Virginia Tech Gay Wong's group. Oh yeah, with Gay Wong. Also, mm -hmm. uh, so there are, even in biomedical optics, there are maybe four or five groups where they, um, they, they develop very soft, very softwares. I think, and all of them have their strengths and their weaknesses. One thing that we really strive to do in this effort is to provide different types of estimators uh, for the same problem. So you can see various statistical, um, you know, variations of how, how you do the sampling, how that might have an impact. Um, so, you know, um, I, I think you have to just, I think it's really important that for your application, whatever code you adopt, you really understand what they're doing on the inside. Because especially when it comes to biomedicine, you want to make sure that you're not making assumptions that can ultimately mislead you to make an erroneous decision. Yeah. Can you comment on uh, the differences between uh, in the results between uh, the scaled Monte Carlo versus the perturbation Monte Carlo? Uh, you explain. Well, um, so if, if we perturb the whole domain, uh, so is that equivalent to the scaled Monte Carlo? Or? He, yeah. So he's asking um, if I can comment on the difference between the scaled Monte Carlo and PMC uh, Monte Carlo results. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so the biggest difference is that um, you know Monte Carlo is a is a, a statist statistical method, and you're calculating a mean and some variance there, and 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 each each photon uh, is contributing in its own way to to that those estimates. In the scaled, uh, the average of a, sub, a conglomerate of photons has been used. Um, and the error is actually propagated from that result. Uh, it's not from the indi individual uh, photons. Um, so, for instance, um, with, with perturbation Monte Carlo, you have no restrictions on the geometry, um, the source definition, your detector definition. Um, for the scale, they assumed a homogeneous tissue. Um, they have a point source. And um, so, the, you know, there's definite uh, limitations in, in the results. Uh, my second question is regarding the type of random number generators. Yeah. So how do you determine that is the best? I mean, well, one, yeah. My question was, I was concerned uh, while running a parallel Monte Carlos because... Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So his question had to do about choosing the random number generator and what happens when you run in parallel. And, um, and how you choose a random number generator, a lot has to do with the length of the period uh, when, it, when it wraps around. Each of them has, uh, you know, they're usually like a linear congru congruential generator where there's kind of a, there's an actual formula to get you from, if you're at one random number, to get you to the next. But you, so, and, and the particular one we did had a very long period is why, uh, why we chose that one. Um, but, um, and your second question, wait, I lost the second question. Oh, um, when you go in parallel, yeah, so what you really should do is there's a group that was in, uh, is, may still be in Florida, Muscogny. Uh, he developed something called SPRNG. And it's a way to seed parallel Monte Carlo so that the, when you combine, say you're going to run, you wanted to run a lot of photons to get one result, and you ran them in parallel. To make sure you could combine all of them to one result, you have to seed the random number generator such that the results of each simulation are not correlated. 
and his SPRNG, if you go to their website, they have downloadable software that tells you how to, to dole out uh, seeds for each of the, yeah, yeah. Thanks, good question. Uh, if I want to get the broadband light source simulation, then is that only method of just change the VUS and the VA, repeat the simulation? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Is there a way to say that again? Yeah. Does uh, all those things uh, relate to the VUS and VA? And then if I get uh, some broadband light source response spectra, then is that only method ch just change the VUS? And yes, 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 yes. So if it, yeah, so if you, right, if you're illuminating with different wavelengths, is that what you're asking? Yeah, then, then definitely, yeah. You have to run a, a simulation for the optical properties that are based on that wavelength. Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. But you could, Jennifer has used uh, PMC to provide results across wavelength. Uh, by perturbing because she figured out what the perturbed optical properties at neighboring wavelengths would be and generating the results and had good success with PMC. Jennifer also, by the way, uh, did PMC based on me scattering and um, and there was a there so there in that PMC there's a there's a weight factor that has to do with the weight the phase function. So that's kind of a PMC volume two. <laughs>